check, check, check. Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Can you check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Hey, Luke. Can you stand right there where the chief exec the executive officer is and see if you can hear me in that monitor? They want to hear this. Yeah. Check. One, two, three, check. Check, one, two, one, two, check, one, two, and one, two, check. Check, one, two, one, two. Check, one, two, check, one, two, check. One, two, check, one, two, check. One, two, check, one, two. Check, one, two, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two, check. Check, 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 one, two, check. Check. Could we have people start to take their seats again? We'll get the sergeant at arms to bring people back to their seats, please. Would the delegates please return to their seats and come to order in a couple of minutes? If you have any of your colleagues out in the hall, if you could tell them, please, to return. You guys are good. That was very fast. Would the House please come to order again? Fellow members of the House of Delegates, it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce to you at this time the President-elect of the California Medical Association, Dr. Paul Finney. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Dr. Finney, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, presidents never get to this podium on their own, and there are a number of folks that I'd like to acknowledge uh, before I launch into my speech. First of all, the District 11 physicians and staff for their years of support and encouragement. Is that right here? In particular, my friend Bill Sandberg, uh, past SSVMS director, without, who, without whose suggestion, I'm not sure I ever really would have considered this role. Bill's here somewhere. There he is, over there. 
Second, to the Permanente Medical Groups, TPMG and SCPMG, for their support of my efforts in organized medicine, and in particular, my medical group leadership, Dr. Jack Rosance, Dr. Chris Palkowski, Dr. Richard Isaacs, Sharon Levine, Robbie Pearl. I can tell you, medical group leadership does not get any better than that. So. <laughs> to my colleagues on the Board of Trustees, including the EC, for their commitment, their constructive criticism, especially their criticism, and for their camaraderie, to the CMA staff for their knowledge and skills and hard work and patience, patience um, that support our efforts and keeps us uh, docs from getting too far afield. To my mentors, the late Ben Landing from uh, Children's Hospital of LA, uh, Carol Berkowitz with AAP, uh, Jay Crossan, and one other very special person I'll tell you about a little bit later in my talk. And my friends here today, a bunch of them, friends, please stand up. Family, you can stay down. Friends. <laughs> <laughs> These uh, friends include Dr. Jack Rosance, one of my medical group leaders, uh, who I do consider a friend. Uh, Dr. Steve Mayberg, um, who was director of the Department of Mental Health for the state of California under three different governors. Happened to be my next door neighbor for a while. Steve and Stuart Drown, executive director of the Little Hoover Commission, whose mom happened to be my mom's lifetime friend before she passed away a year or so ago. And most of all, my family, um, Robin Finney and Chris Roberts, two scary smart PhD kids in the public policy arena. Robin's here, Chris is back doing work uh, back there. Karen and Robert Hammer, who are here, parents of our first grandchild, a little baby girl named Quinn. Uh, Karen, I think, is holding Quinn. And uh, Robert, I believe, uh, well, he held, and I think he still holds the bench press record at Boise State at 505 pounds. <laughs> Uh, Susan Comstock, uh, also grandmother to baby Quinn, my brother Dave Finney, and one of his daughters, Jackie, who's attending her first semester here at Sac State. Uh, William and Tessie Goddard, my extended family, brother and sister, another story there. Uh, and my 87-year young mom, Dean Finney, a uh, mentor for over two decades at CSU Northridge uh, in early childhood education, a role she just gave up this last year. So. And to my, I mean, my beautiful wife of 38 years and my best friend, Suzanne. <laughs> so family, you guys stand up. Everybody. And finally, all of you, for your trust and for being here as the voice of organized medicine at a time in history, I don't think anybody would argue is more important, actually. And truth be told, I never expected to stand here before you today in this capacity. I don't really think of myself as an ambitious person. And frankly, it was never on my bucket list to be president of CMA. I told Bill Sandberg was the first guy that suggested it to me. That said, I have developed a passion for this role. And as I speak to you today about three imperatives critical to our success as an association, I'll weave in some stories from my own experience which help form that mindset and which will give you a little bit better idea of who I am. I think you should know what you're getting for the next 12 months. What I'm not gonna do today, uh, maybe a little different, but I'm not gonna lecture you on ACA, AMA, MICRA, SGR, CMS, GYPSI, DUALS, CALPAC, the Exchange, Medi-Cal, Medical Necessity, uh, peer review, CMA's position on Jerry Brown's tax initiative, or even cannabis. So, not gonna do that. <laughs> And I'm not going to rehash that really long list of unfinished business that Dr. Hay left for me uh, and he referred to in his speech yesterday. I'm also not going to list CMA's recent um, successful and, and sometimes uh, troubling effort or uh, challenging efforts in the legal, uh, legislative, and regulatory arenas, uh, which really comprise the guts of our advocacy effort. I think they're better uh, sources than this speech for that information. What I will do today is keep things simple. Uh, a few stories and three messages. Um, ideas I hope you'll keep in mind over the next 12 months as we navigate that list of unfinished business and come head to head with some new challenges. And I'll start by talking about a CMA member, one that I know pretty well actually, because I am that member. 
I joined the CMA in the, in the 80s, but I wasn't always in, in, as involved as I am now. I don't, re, I don't actually remember my exact thinking at the time I joined CMA. I think I did because I thought it was probably important and because that's what you did if you're a doctor. Things like that used to happen. My practice was and still is, I think many of you know, in a large integrated group, stable income, robust infrastructure, um, easy to settle in and, and not really worry much about the world outside and, and settle in, I did. But from almost the first years of my practice, my professional, my professional life was a mix of clinical and non-clinical. And in addition to a full range of inpatient and outpatient work, I became involved in non-clinical roles in both uh, PEDS and department PEDS administration and in, in, in the community largely. That taught me about operations and about how science and logic are necessary but not sufficient in the world of politics and policy. And at some point it became clear to me that even in a large integrated group, you couldn't insulate yourself from the accelerating change in economic, technological, and political uh, context for medicine. So after several years of saying no, I finally said yes and joined my medical society board at last uh, beginning to understand the connection between organized medicine and what I wanted for my practice, what I wanted for the health of my community, what I wanted um, to be able to give to the profession uh, during my career. It took a while, but the dots connected themselves, um, forming a bigger picture, as I suspect they did for most people here in this room. The dots do not connect, however, themselves for all physicians. And although CMA boasts some 35,000 members across the state, this is still less than half the number of licensed California physicians. Clearly, medicine has failed to, uh, organized medicine has failed to compete effectively for priority on the real-time agenda of the majority of California physicians. Why is that? Well, we've heard a little bit about that today. A lot of physicians are just frankly overloaded with exploding regulation, decreasing reimbursement rates, an overwhelming flow of information, EMR mandates, increasingly shared demands at home with uh, two income families, and a problematic culture um, risk of risk-free entitlement and other directed accountability, the, what I call the social pathologies of entitlement disease and, and accountability disorder. Um, with all that on, on their plate, a lot of physicians just feel they don't have the time and it, it's hard to blame them. Adding one more thing just kind of breaks the agenda. These physicians have, however, not made the connection between their professional needs and how organized medicine can help. And the odds are that they won't. They won't make that connection unless we do it for them. So how do we do that? Uh, well, historically, we've tried lots of things. Some have worked, some have not. Some are pretty entertaining. I'm not, I won't torture you with that list. I have some favorites. Um, we certainly have indulged in what I've, I call freeloader indignation, which is that heartfelt guilt trip that we try to put on other physicians who don't pay dues but benefit from ours. But, you know, they're not listening. And to a large extent, we aren't either. We're, we're talking right past them, inventing value we think that they should pay for. And, and for, for those over half of the physicians in California that aren't members, it just doesn't resonate. To be fair, um, you know, recent efforts at CMA are paying off. And you've heard about the yesterday about the high levels of penetration we have in Stanislaus and Santa Clara and San Mateo and about the recent uh, gains of hundreds of physicians in, in Southern California, Monterey, and Sacramento. Um, thanks to these efforts and to a new focus on retention, which is something we totally ignored before a couple of years ago, putting some money and actually keeping people who become members as members by reminding them frequently of the value. Um, but thanks to those things, uh, membership is up significantly for the first time in years, and you saw the numbers yesterday. But heavy membership losses have occurred in other areas, and, and there's still some particularly ge particular geographies and some particular diversities that we have yet to crack. And with our overall penetration less than 40% statewide, we still have a long way to go. We're not going to get there unless we work um, in a different way. And I think we've started to, but I think we need to do more of it. With a different mindset, an active process, and it's one that starts with listening to those potential non-members. Freeloader indignation is, feels good, you know, but it's not gonna get us where we need to be. It's on us to discover the unique needs of each potential member and to work with them to create opportunities for win-win. Otherwise, they, they're just gonna hang out out there and they're not gonna join. 
In some cases, what seals the deal, as in uh, Sacramento with uh, one of the medical groups up there, maybe something CMA already provides that they just didn't know about, education. And others, and I suspect this is the larger group, we may have to educate ourselves about what's going on in their practices rather than assume we have the answers to what would bring them value. The dots can connect in a lot of different ways. Um, but with membership, the lifeblood of CMA, it's imperative that every single one of us works to make that happen for those physicians and medical groups which have not yet joined. We're not going to succeed otherwise as an association. Connect the dots. Second message. Len Nichols, uh, who's a health economist and health services researcher at George Mason University, addressed the CMA Leadership Academy last spring and described successful health reform as a participation sport. Some of the speakers yesterday and earlier um, referred to him. If you were at the uh, Leadership Academy, you may, re may remember his graphic for physician participation in healthcare reform. It was an inflatable raft with two physicians in it going over what looks like a class four rapid. And the guy in front has an abject look of fear on his face. And the guy in back is just looks totally catatonic. And neither one of these two physicians has e even one oar in the water. And that was the graphic for how it feels to participate in healthcare reform. Uh, but that, that, those feelings of fear weren't his point. Len's point was that without physician input and leadership, economists, policy wonks, budget hawks, MBAs, and, and certainly politicians, um, Dr. Pan accepted, of course, um, are not going to get it right. Uh, they're likely to get it wrong. And only with, only physicians know how to balance medical care wisely as we figure out how to realign incentives towards a sustainable health system and a stable fiscal future. So Len, in his talk, told us uh, in sort of a, an oblique reference to a, Apollo 13 that I'm not sure you knew he was making, he said, failure is not an option. And in his inimitable southern draw, um, he put the onus squarely on our shoulders and said, you, you guys have to solve this. You physicians have to solve this. The rest of them are not going to do that. Actually, what he said was, y'all got to solve this. And uh, it was quite entertaining, actually, to listen to. But as I said, his southern drawl is inimitable, so well, maybe I shouldn't have tried. Well, Len's message on, on you, let's have physician involvement really dovetailed nicely with the, the presentation right after what given by Dave Logan, who's a professor at the USC Marshall School of Business. Dave defined uh, something he called the default future, a concept you heard about from both Do Dustin and Dr. Hay uh, yesterday. Drilling down on that concept a little bit, the default future is the future that you get if you look ahead and you complain about it and you get ready for it and you get resigned to it, but you don't do anything about it because you know it's going to happen, so why try? Just you know, complain and get ready. Dave defined leaders as smart, otherwise normal folks who do make something happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise that changes that default future. People who say, look at the default future and say, no, not, that's not going to happen. Uh, and they devote some part of their time and their energy to a future they envision or invent. The intersect of the messages between Len um, and, on one side and Dave on the other side is really powerful in the context of healthcare reform and why I've spent some time going into it again. Uh, because the default future absent physician involvement and input is one in which what we're likely to get is quality measured in dollars, value available if you can pay for it, physician decisions controlled by payers and hospital systems and regulators rather than by medical training, experience, evidence, and the doctor-patient relationship uh, becomes kind of a casualty of not just an afterthought. It doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. But it's on us, again, on us to lead change and create that future that we invent, one that's patient-centric, not profit-centric, physician-driven, evidence-based, high-value, high-quality, and universally accessible. That's the future we need to invent. There are many ways to lead change, and it'll be different for everybody. For some of you, it'll be a little time. For some, a whole lot. Some of you, a little, some now, some later. But some effort will be necessary in all of our parts to act as leaders and say no to that default future. As with membership, it's imperative that each one of us is thinking and working on that in some way every day. And you know, our, our patients expect that of us. You know, I was in, I was in Rayleigh's uh, a while back. Rayleigh's, uh, 
Rayleigh's is a um, market chain here in Sacramento. And I was at the register, and I was wondering if I was going to exceed, you know, hit the uh, double century mark again, uh, which I never did on my bike, but um, I frequently do at the register, 200 bucks. You know, I'm never below that for some reason. And this new checker at Rayleigh's, um, a young woman I hadn't seen before, looked up at me after um, uh, checking my charge card, and she said, I remember her, brand, she had big brown eyes, and I remember her big brown eyes kind of opened up, you know, a little wider, and she said, she said, oh, you're a doctor. Oh, you're a doctor. That, and it really surprised me, because I've never, frankly, felt all that special because of my degree, but the look in that young woman's eyes stuck with me, and I remember that look, as I wondered later whether she reacts the same way to other professionals, you know, like, oh, you're a trial attorney. <laughs> Maybe not. The fact is that the public sees something special in physicians. In spite of all the changes in healthcare, people still place us on a pedestal and look to physicians for answers to health problems at all levels. The polls show it, actually, and you can see it in their eyes, and you can hear it in their voices. We owe it to them, if not to ourselves, to work to inform and guide the healthcare reform process each of us in our own way and say no to that default future and work as leaders to uh, create a better future that we invent. It's not going to happen otherwise. Again, it's on us. Lead change. Last message. I've mentioned a number of mentors. Very important to me. Physicians and others who shaped my thinking and my approach to medicine. One of the ones I haven't mentioned um, yet, and Susanna will remember them, my wife will remember them, was a physician we called the saint. <laughs> the saint. Joseph St. Jem Jr. Joe was a mountain of a man with really impressive stature, both physically and academically, actually. He was like a father to the residents um, of the Harbor UCLA Medical Center a Pediatrics Program, which he chaired and I attended. He demanded a lot of us, but he nurtured our clinical and professional development in a way I'll never forget. He was at various times our teacher, our advisor, our boss, our colleague, someone who's bringing us into medicine. Um, his likeness, a um, little, little headshot cut out from one of the throwaway medical journals, journals has been affixed to my, above my workspace for 25 years. I'm still there today, actually. Dr. St. Jem died um, in an ER following complications of an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. He was attended there by a guy I used to know, I, I knew a long time ago, named Marty Smilkstein, one of uh, Joe's former residents who ran and called the code at the end of Joe's life. Marty wrote a testament uh, to the saint, published in Pediatrics in February 1987, as one of the most poignant and powerful descriptions of a mentor I think I've ever read, and I commend it to you. February uh, Pediatrics, 1987. Just Google the saint. You'll find it. Um, I recall the saint, Joe St. Jem, 25 years later, because I firmly believe mentorship to be one of our most critical imperatives. Medical students, residents, and young physicians, the ones we mentor today here in our offices and here at CMA and in our offices as well, won't uh, only provide our medical care. They'll be the leading advocates in the social and political arenas that will affect uh, the science and art of medicine, the care and well-being of patients, the protection of public health, and the betterment of the medical profession, in a word, the mission of CMA. Mentorship deserves our attention, and it will be an area of, fo of focus for me over the next year. A healthy re future requires that kind of upfront investment, investment, and it's something each one of us can do in our daily lives. Bringing a medical student, student resident, or young physician colleague to a dinner or board meeting or other event at a county medical society can do wonders to engage these future leaders and help them understand the bigger picture, connect the dots for them. Over my next 24 months as a CMR, CMA officer, I'll also continue to work with the deans of the California medical schools to encourage involvement of their students and residents in organized medicine, work we've already started uh, with Jay Hansen uh, at USC and UCLA. And I'll also continue to work on the electronic spaces and infrastructure that will allow our younger and uh, more tech-savvy physicians to access everything they need from CMA securely and conveniently on a handheld device. And I'll continue a mindset I find increasingly valuable 
that in many ways our medical students and residents and young physicians mon mentor us. There's an example of uh, this uh, reverse mentorship that I know some of the trustees and I, I'm sure the EC will remember that occurred at a board meeting, board of trustees meeting, while I was board chair. A uh, medical student uh, trustee named Laura Gephardt, you guys out there remember Laura Gephardt? Uh, uh, energetic and vocal, very vocal uh, medical student trustee, moved that the board adopt an online electronic distribution of board materials as an alternative to killing trees. Now the word, words killing trees weren't in the motion actually. Um, there were all kinds of objections. I mean, there are not enough you know, outlets, there's not enough space on the table, it's too hard to navigate the We can't do this, we've never done it before, and why should we do it now? But when Laura shamed the physicians in the room by reminding them that AMA was already doing it, first of all, and at least the medical students, and that she would provide a personal tutorial for any trustee who needed one on how to use you know, electronic distribution materials. Uh, the motion passed by like an overwhelming margin. It was, it was very cool. <laughs> but uh, the board moved forward that day uh, based on that reverse mentorship, as has now, you, you'll see the house, and we're better for it. So no better investment in the future of our association mentoring, uh, another imperative I feel going forward, investing in the future, nurture the young. So we have a busy and exciting year ahead, kind of a perfect storm created by very tight presidential election, lame duck session in Congress, the SGR teed up yet again, ongoing developments with the ACA, which will vary depending on the results of the election, very aggressive efforts, if not the most aggressive efforts across the country uh, with the exchange in California with, with Peter Lee, who uh, intends to change the business of health insurance in California. And if that were not enough, we've got the budget deficit, the debt ceiling, and sequestration. I mean, you put all that together, that is a perfect storm. And who knows when the next assault on MICRA is going to be, around what corner. CMAs work in legal and legislative and regulatory arenas will continue in all these areas and will be robust in no small measure with the participation and direction of many of you and, and by me. And as we devote ourselves to those efforts, I hope you'll remember the messages I've tried to create for you today, those three imperatives I see as critical to both our short and long-term successes and association. First, connect the dots. Membership is the lifeblood of CMA, but it's on us to find the linkages between the needs of our potential members and the value CMA uh, can work with them to provide. Lead change. California and our nation will be best served by a healthcare delivery system that is patient-centric, physician-driven, high value, high quality, evidence-based, and universally accessible. Without docs leading the way, towards that end, we're, gonna, we're very likely to get something very different. And the public show, expects us to show up for that. You can see it in their eyes. And nurture the young. Our medical students, our residents, and young physicians provide them with the guidance and experience they need to be successful as they take on the medical and social and political reins from our hands. Mentor them, but be open to the reverse mentoring that can keep us all fresh and honest. So in closing, we live in turbulent and uncertain times which are very likely to produce the most rapid change in the delivery of health care in decades. What an incredible time to be part of the profession. We'll face many issues, and I think navigating them will be kind of like driving down a highway during an earthquake. <laughs> How fitting for California. Uh, but as we do that drive, the decisions we make about mentorship, our role in leading change, um, and mentoring those who follow us will, will have a major influence on both the short and long-term successes of CMA. Those kinds of decisions will command my attention during the year, and I hope they will for you as well. For after all, as Dumbledore said to Harry Potter, in the book, The Chamber of Secrets, and you didn't think you were going to get out of here without a quote from Harry Potter from a pediatrician, right? The quote is, it is not our abilities which show what we truly are. It is our choices. So, choose well, work hard, there's a lot to do. Let's get to it. Thank you.
Thank you. Dr. Hay. It's my pleasure to present the Presidential Medal to President Paul Finney. Mrs. Finney, would you please come forward? Now for something completely different. <laughs> one thing your speakers forgot <clears throat> to mention is on the back page of page one, there was one report for filing that we did not either mention in the consent calendar, but it was not extracted. It's item number 22. Absent objection, that report will be filed. I appreciate your tolerance of the oversight. We're back to reference committee B. Could we get our committee back up to the uh, podium, please? I believe we have some announcements from CalPAC, hopefully. Six. Microphone six, there we are. Yes. Excuse me. Um, Mr. Speaker, a point of personal privilege. Uh, although we're not quite ready yet to see um, Dr. Thorpe cut off his mustache, but we, we still have hope for that. Um, we've done better than we've ever done so far. We thank you for all your generous donations. We're hoping that we can still achieve our goal, but we've, uh, our total is $133,000. That's far in excess of anything we've ever uh, done during the House. And District one is ahead. <laughs> district two is second. Uh, I'm sorry, District 11. It's two ones. Whoa. <laughs> oh, Freudian slip. The Finney factor. Uh, boy, that was a Freudian slip. I'm originally from District two. Um, <laughs> district seven is very close behind. We also, uh, as I told you earlier, we have raffles for those that donated $1,000 or above. And I think we're going to pick two raffle winners. The first prize uh, will be a free membership to CMA. We're, just to be fair, we're letting somebody pick that hasn't seen any of <laughs> And the winner of CMA membership is da, 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 Suresh Sashdeva. Uh, I hope I pronounced it somewhat correctly. Is, is that, is that you? No? Congratulations. Cool. No. And we're going to pick a second one. And this will be for a VIP tour of the cupola of the Capitol. Whoa. I think that's kind of nice. That would be cool. Remember, you don't have to be present to win, so continue to, to get your $1,000 donations in. <laughs> and the winner of that is <laughs> Dr. Brennan Cassidy. Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, that's great. This is a good opportunity to announce that we gave uh, Dr. Cassidy an award at the CalPAC meeting um, on Friday, and that was the James C. McLagan Award for longstanding commitment to the goals and the vision of CalPAC and CMA. And we're very proud that we 
had that award to give to him, so let's give him applause. He had to leave a little early, but... Okay. Thank you, so all we need are about, um, I guess about seven more, no, about 17, 17. more, 17 more um, thousand dollar donations, or if three people want to donate at the highest level, we'll be there. And there goes Dr. Thorpe's mustache. If not, he gets to keep it. Thank you very much. <laughs>except I'd like to amend it to a small addition of their conclusion. And I have already submitted that. And that says that Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal managed care payers have actually sound rates, but not less than existing Medicare rates. The reason I added is for clarification, because if we have different actuarial rates in different counties, then there'll be confusion when these patients migrate from one county to the other, and there could be denial of services for providers. Second, I also thought that there may be a clarification that uh, we may need from the legal department, because when uh, contractors contract with the states or private payers contract with the CMS for medical rates, both federal laws, Stock Act, Anti-Kickback Act, as well as corporate integrity agreements come into play. And they usually require fair market value among referral providers. And if primary care providers are paid at one rate and specialty uh, providers are paid at a different rate, this could violate the existing federal laws. So I like a clarification from legal department and I'd like to submit that with this amendment for um, your consideration. Did, did you have a second, or did I miss something? Do we have a second? Okay, good. Um, the legal department is on its way. I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I think the question is whether you can have different rates for different types of providers. And if that's the question, the ACL, ACA already provides for that. Okay. Okay. I, microphone two. The Stark Law comes includes Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services as far as the definition of fair market value. If referrals occur between contracting parties for services reimbursed by federal health care programs, when federal health care programs contract with states for manda mandated services they have to follow this doctrine, otherwise they are in violation of their own laws. Microphone one, please. The Stark Lodge laws, which are the anti-referral, self-referral laws, would not be violated for an increased Medi-Cal rate. That's nice to hear. Anybody else wish to speak to this? Microphone four. Sergio Flores, a large group. My only concern is if you tie something to Medicare and then we get a 27.5% drop, uh, that's always a concern, and I don't like tying contracts to Medicare. Any other comments? Microphone one. Basil Besh, specialty delegation, speaking for myself. Uh, to the last speaker's point, I think they're establishing a floor so that it goes not below Medicare rates. 
uh, but there's certainly no ceiling. If they want to pay us more, we're always in favor of that. Microphone two. Speaking on behalf of delegation, we had um, initially um, vote for the amendment and also right now um, for the minimum established. Thank you. Microphone three. Virtos, District 7, speaking for myself as an individual. Um, I would like to amend this by uh, second order deletion. That is in order. I would like to delete the words, and that Medi-Cal and managed care plans should reimburse at actuarially sound rates. <clears throat> May I speak to that? Well, I was just going to say, I almost think that's editorial. Um, do I hear any objection to doing that? With, this, with unanimous consent, that'll be done. Thank you. All right. Anybody else wish to speak to this as amended? Um, on the amendment, I should say. Uh, Dr. Dr. Howard, any comments? No comment at this time. Okay, so what we have before us is the amendment that you see projected. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? It is amended. Now we're back to the original amended resolution, item 18. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? It's carried. Next is item 19, page 14. This is the last item of this uh, reference committee, so the reference committee F should uh, start to think about coming forward. Uh, Dr. Howard. Your reference committee recommends approval of resolution 22212 as amended and asks for a yes vote on it. The resolved portion is amended to read. Thank you. Uh, microphone one. Sproul, author, and speaking on behalf of the specialty delegation, uh, we would like to uh, amend uh, the reference committee's recommendation uh, by total substitution of the original three resolves uh, with uh, two minor uh, wording changes, and uh, they're displayed on the uh, screen. Do you want me to speak to it? Is it a second? Did you have it with your delegation? The delegation second is thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay, so the two minor changes. Um, we've been told by, um, I guess, experts that you can't use an actual CPT code in a resolution. Uh, so we're referring to ENM uh, codes in a generic instead of the specific code. Uh, excuse me, but I think we're talking about legislative. I think you can use uh, CPT codes, as far as I understand it. Francisco, is there any reason not to? Okay, there's no objection. If, you don't, if that, that's the only reason you're doing it, you don't have to. Well, there's also the possibility that they could start auditing 99214, so I think leaving it as a general would be reasonable at this point, although I will certainly um, defer to the will of the House on that. I don't think they're going to audit 99211s. You needn't worry about that. <laughs> Okay, so um, we were concerned uh, that the, re uh, the reference committee didn't, um, uh, you know, the, basically restated what is existing policy. And the concern that we ha have, we know that CMA and AMA oppose RAC audits of VM codes, but we wanted them to go on and ask for something more, which is in these original resolves. And that specific um, feedback data uh, regarding uh, the specialties most affected, the percentage of denied claims, and when appealed, how many are reversed on appeal. And we wanted to include elected Washington officials. Uh, we've been very disappointed in um, our uh, specialty ACP when we've had conversations with CMS. Uh, they don't seem to really listen to what we're saying, and so we wanted to include elected Washington officials as well. Yeah. I'm not really sure, but I have to Thank you. <clears throat> Microphone three on the amendment. Uh, Shorenstein, uh, District 7, speaking on behalf of the delegation with unanimous support for the amendment um, in favor of the amended resolution. I am a general internist. I believe that excellent cost-effective care of my elderly patients with complex chronic illnesses requires a careful history 
and physical diagnosis, discussion of prescription medications and pertinent lab tests, counseling of the patient and their family members, and thorough documentation of your actions and time. But that's not what CMS has in mind. They have deputized a recovery audit, audit contractor in Atlanta to, quote, scour claims filed as far back as October 2007, according to the latest AMA News. This RAC, or RAC, gets 9 to 10, 12 percent commission of all claims that they downcode to a lower level of time and service. That's a healthy bounty for the RAC to downcode liberally and send doctors bills for so-called overpayments. So it's no surprise that the RAC does a sloppy job. Over 46 percent of their downcoded claims are overturned on appeal. In my personal case, I appealed four downcoded claims and got 100 percent of them overturned. That's a pretty bad track record. But only 5 percent of doctors take the time and effort to appeal. The net effect is to burden and harass family practice doctors, internists, consultants, and specialists, and it works to the detriment of good patient care. The AMA is Please already sum up. is already urging CMS to abandon their plan to expand the RAC. District 70 and I urge the CMA House of Delegates to put their weight behind the AMA in this effort. Please support the amended resolution. Thank you. Microphone four. Mel Sterling, specialty delegation, uh, speaking as a disadvantaged internist. There aren't too many people who will go to the effort that Dr. Shorenstein has gone to. And the reason is it, it's very costly. It's costly in terms of time. We are not paid for that time. The, our previous experience with the 99214 audits was instructive. In my hospital community, when it became apparent that 99214s were being audited, it was amazing how few 99214s were submitted. So what does that mean? That means that either those doctors were not paid appropriately for those 99214s, or patient care was diminished because those doctors now found that they could not afford to spend that much time doing the appropriate evaluation of those, pa uh, those patients. And then my final comment would be, um, uh, when I was a hospice director, I had the opportunity of defending my hospice when CMS alleged that we were uh, inappropriately billing. And of course, um, like Dr. Shorenstein's uh, experience, the administrative law judge was able to see the light. Thank you, microphone four. Thank you, Jim Hay, president. And for your amusement, being president didn't keep me from getting caught in this. Eight charts, 99214s. I've had electronic records for over eight years. I know this stuff, all of which were downcoded, six of them down to a 99212. All of them appealed and all of them reversed. I learned a lot about proper coding and I learned a lot about, gee, maybe I put the time, because I spend, before I would do a level four, it's always a half hour of my time, but I didn't use the time code. Now I've learned to use the time code. But it's amazing to me that this, in my view, was a huge waste of governmental money in order to put us through the ringer. I strongly support this amendment, and I cer certainly support the idea of making it broader and not just 99215s. Thank you, microphone four. Thank you, uh, Jim Hinsdale, San Jose, and your immediate past president. Uh, I too can't tell you how outraged we doctors should be that this is going on, and, and really thank and congratulate Roz Shorenstein for what she's bringing forward here. Uh, this, this just really represents the worst in what our government does, uh, certainly to doctors. It, it's shameful. Uh, ultimately, we got to find something else for these guys to do, okay? I mean, I mean putting bounties on doctors is just the pits. And, and I, I just, I got to stop. It's just so bad. So let's get together and, and stop this nonsense. Thank you.
Thank you, microphone three. Art Lurvey and I support the resolutions. I, under disclosure, work for the, the MAC, not the recovery auditors. They don't like to use the word RAC anymore. But I would like to have you understand that the Office of Inspector General had a eight-year report that came out in April suggesting a very, very high incidence of high upcoding uh, in compared to years before, and that Ms. Sibelius and the OIG sent a letter to hospitals warning them about upcoding of electronic records. And I think the message that might help people is to understand that many EHRs or EMRs are what you want encourage upcoding by recommending a code that may not be supported. Um, and I also, in fact, work with ACP. I'm a member of ACP and on their board that help write this. Thank you. Microphone one, 60 seconds. Sproul, author, I just want to point out to the board that there is a fourth resolve that is included in this amendment that's not being currently displayed on the screen, and that's to forward uh, these resolves for national action. Fair enough. Microphone three. Um, Kaplan, Los Angeles. Uh, briefly, um, the more you know about, I support this. I would make the additional comments. The more you know about this, the better. And Dr. Lurvey has been a wonderful teacher in the past, and I recommend you ask him to teach you as much as he can or as much as you can learn about this. Thank you. Um, I think 60 seconds, microphone three. 15 seconds. The AMA is on record as opposing this. You can ask for national a action, of course, but the AMA has long been advocating against this, and I think most of us involved with the AMA know that. Thank you. Seeing no one else at the microphone, what we have before us is the amendment by deletion and substitution of the resolves that you see projected in front of you. All those in favor of this amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It is amended. Now we're back to the amended uh, re resolves, resolution. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It is carried. Uh, Dr. Howard, your concluding remarks, please. This concludes the report of Reference Committee B. I would like to thank the CMA members who testified, our committee members, Edward Bentley, MD, David Giorgio, MD, Darla Holland, MD, Jeffrey Kleeman, MD, William Lewis, MD, George Paz, MD, and our great staff, CMA staff, David Ford, and Ina Shimabukuro. Number nine. Um, and I would remind uh, the delegates that we do have one more item that was tabled to a date, to a time certain first thing in the morning. So he will be back briefly. Thank you. If reference, reference Committee F could please come to the lower dais. <clears throat> Are there any other points? Do we hear Dr. Larson going for some extra money to uh, shave the beard? We have just about one hour. We'll be mindful of the fact that many of you and maybe all of you are going to go to the gala tonight and we will be sure to get you out timely. Speaker. Dr. Cedars. Members of the CMA House of Delegates, 
The reports and resolutions referred to Reference Committee F have been considered by our committee, which met at 1.15 p.m. in the Schmidt Room of the Sheraton Grand Sacramento Hotel, Sacramento, California, on October 13, 2012. Members of the committee present include Michael Cedars, M.D., Chair, Christopher R. Hancock, M.D., Craig H. Kleiger, M.D., Maria T. Limberis, M.D., James B. Rubin, M.D., Robert Dudley Stone, M.D., and Ronald W.B. Wyatt, Jr., M.D. The House has before you Reference Committee F's report. Are there extractions? Microphone number six. Uh, item number three. Item number three is extracted. Are there further extractions? Microphone six. Number eight. Item eight is extracted. Microphone three. Number 10. Number 10 is extracted. I see no one else at the microphones. You have extracted items three. One more. If you could I'm just sorry, microphone three. I think she just made a mistake. Isn't it 11? I, item, item number. Six, item 611 is number 10 or number That 11? is number 10, it, okay. resolution 611. Okay, once again, you have extracted items 3, 8, and 10. Microphone 6, do you have an extraction? Um, actually, I meant number 7, not, not number 8. Okay, item 608, is that what you intended? Right. I, item 7, resolution 608. Let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back. You have extracted item 3, item 7, and item 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Seeing no other extractions, you have before you the remaining consent calendar of items 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 9, and 11 through 18. And 8 because I've scratched it. Thank you. All those in favor of, of adopting the consent calendar, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say nay. It is adopted. First business is item number three, page three, Dr. Cedars. Your reference committee recommends approval of the following substitute resolution for resolution 60312 and 60412 and asks for a yes vote on it. Microphone six. Uh, I want to make the substitution for the word uh, encourage and replace it with the phrase advocate for legislative or regulatory action, and then it goes on to say, prohibiting the sale of alcohol and or tobacco in retail outlets where medical clinics are operated. Alcohol or tobacco, correct? And or, and or, tobacco. And or tobacco. It's redundant. It's al okay. Alcohol, okay. alcohol or tobacco. Okay, so you are deleting the current Resolved 4 of the Reference Committee report and substituting a new Resolved 4 for that same, correct? Um, and otherwise accepting the rest of the Reference Committee report. You're, you're amending? Uh, yes, I'll say okay. yes. Yes. Okay, so, right. yeah. Yeah, editorially, that should just be alcohol or tobacco. I'm sorry, and tobacco. Okay, so you have before you now an amendment by substitution of resolved four. I think that's the easiest way to view this. Total substitution of the resolved four on the amendment. Microphone six. Um, yes, we need something a little more than CMA just encourage um, uh, the prohibition of um, alcohol or tobacco being sold in uh, retail outlets that also have retail, that also have medical clinics. If you really want to get a handle on this, you really have to do it either by legislative action or regulatory action. So I need something a little more. I'm not saying sponsoring legislation. I'm not even saying support legislation. I'm just saying advocating for legislative or regulatory action. Thank you. Is there any further debate? Microphone five. Uh, Bedard, speaking as an individual, one of the questions, I have a question it says physicians violating the corporate practice of bar. I'm not sure what that means since physicians can employ other physicians. Lay entities cannot employ physicians. Okay, if you could please hold that discussion. We are on the amendment, which is the resolve four. You are quoting from a different resolve. 
We'll get there. We'll get there. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Microphone three. Uh, Scott Carlin from LACMA. Speaking as an individual and going out on a limb here, uh, we, we typically stand up for the rights of people to shop where they want. And I'd love to hear whether there's real evidence that such a policy would actual, actually dis discourage inappropriate use of alcohol and tobacco or improve the health care of Californians. Because there is a price to every limit that we place on society. Microphone one. Uh, Rogan Administrative Forum. I'd like to point out there's an urgent care center not far from here. It's in the same shopping center as a Raley supermarket or a Safeway supermarket. So it would seem that that would be prohibited under this recommendation. Microphone one. Sproul speaking, especially delegation speaking as an individual. Um, currently, I think it's this uh, CMA policy to uh, oppose uh, uh, tobacco usage in hospitals and um, uh, medical uh, settings. I think uh, if we're going to start providing health care and re retail outlets, uh, I think we should also discourage uh, sale and use of tobacco and, and if you so desire alcohol, because we don't provide alcohol or sell alcohol in hospitals either. Uh, that this would really be consistent with CMA current policy. Thank you. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Seeing none, you have before you an amendment by substitution for resolved four as projected. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, say nay. Let, let's try it again. Seems like I get the close votes. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed say nay. nay. It passes. Okay, it is amended. We now have before you the amended resolution. Is there any further debate? Microphone five. In the, speaking as an individual, I guess opposed to the resolution, I think there's a couple of critical issues. One, physicians don't violate the corporate practice of medicine bar. They're entitled to hire and employ other physicians. Also exempted from the corporate bar are any government, city, or state-owned hospitals. So it's not only the University of California at San Francisco General Hospital, all the VA hospitals, they're exempt. I think what you're going to, and the question is, what is adequate physician supervision? With the technology we have now, I believe you could have a retail clinic where a physician would monitor it in real time from an office 20 miles away, and if there was any emergency, could access 911. And I think with the technology we have, you can do adequate physician supervision electronically over the internet or by telemedicine. So I don't think uh, there's so many ways to avoid the corporate bar. Uh, hospitals are gonna start branding retail clinics. Physicians will hire other physicians. Thank you, and I'll ask microphone four to give me a moment. Francisco at microphone one, legal. Microphone one, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, wanted to highlight something with respect to resolve number three. Uh, it can be read to be beyond current law. In other words, to uh, expand and allow the, the hiring of physicians beyond the current law and the exceptions that are in the books. Uh, to address that issue after the exempt, if the House were to add pursuant, pursuant to current law, it would just capture the current exceptions, including the UC, uh, the, the free clinics, and, and some of the other provisions in current law. Can, okay, Mr. Silva, could you state again what you're recommending sure. we change? The third resolve, as it re I read it, to be more expansive the current law and potentially allow more exemptions their corporate practice of medicine. So the House, if you adopt that, you would expand our policy beyond that. If you want to make it just so it applies to the current exemptions that are in the books now, after be exempt, you can add pursuant to current law. So that way you limit it to the current exceptions and don't broaden uh, House policy. I'm going to go out on a limb here with the House. Does anybody have objection to adding that language for clarification? Seeing none, let's add that language after the word exempt on the first line of resolve three. M microphone four. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Haskins, but speaking as an individual, a, a point. I'd like a point of information, please. I'd like to know from government relations what the political ramifications of passing this resolution would be. That's certainly a reasonable question. Microphone one. And we're talking about the Resolve 4 that says advocate for legislative or regulatory action. Um, obviously, this would be a big fight in the Capitol between us and the retail outlets. And I think part of it is where you want to spend your resources if you want us to get engaged in a, in a fight that big. And the other part I would also say is when we're talking about retail health clinics, we have publicly said that there are some models that work. Um, the Sutter model actually being one of them. So this would limit those types of models as well. So it would have an impact. Thank you. Microphone six. Um, this, in, in San Francisco, uh, they bar pharmacies from selling tobacco. In other states, they have barred retail health clinic it's being located in retail outlets that sell tobacco or alcohol. This has controlled and stemmed the uh, expansion of retail health clinics. The retail health clinics in this, in this setting are staffed exclusively by nurse practitioners, and the physician oversight is quite dubious where it's simply by telephone uh, backup with a university health center acting as a telephone backup. In fact, it's, it's really unclear what's happening, what's happening in the South San Fernando Valley and in Manhattan Beach and in the west side of Los Angeles as to who is the backup, what is the physician oversight uh, in this instance, okay? And so if you notice, we're not excluding physicians employing physicians, the term is used adequate physician oversight in this resolution. So if you can show me, uh, and it hasn't been shown yet, that uh, telemedicine is at the point where you have truly adequate physician oversight, you know, I'd like to see that. Microphone three. Microphone three, please. Point, point of information. Are point. hospitals considered retail outlets? Hospitals provide alcohol to a certain portion of their patients. I, 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 yeah, well, they sell it by having the insurance company pay if they can. Um, I, I don't have a legal answer to that question. I certainly would have, wouldn't consider it so. Do we have any comment from staff? Yeah, Francisco. Uh, Mr. Silva? Microphone one, please. Well, in the, in, the, in the hospital setting, you would have, uh, you know, perhaps they, the, the retail, it would be where they sell food. Uh, but I, I think what you would do in this instance, you look at the intent of, of the house, and it's pretty clear that the intent of the house is not to apply to hospitals. No, they sell in the cafeteria, too. Thank you. Okay. Microphone three. And no microphone. Oh. Cheyenne Roy, uh, uh, are, are representing the uh, RFS, representing me as an individual. Um, the question against this amendment, the question is would this prevent future um, uh, service to underserved areas where um, uh, things like telemedicine, where there may be, may or may not be inadequate physician supervision, but Telemedicine with inadequate physician supervision in uh, underserved areas is better than no, uh, better than no uh, care at all. So, would this something like this prevent that in the future? Microphone two. Uh, John Lester from the OMSS, speaking as an individual in strong support of this. Um, I'm a primary care doctor, and one quick comment uh, concerning the CMA advocating for legislation. I don't think that's sponsoring it or 
pushing it or spending a lot of money on it, but I think the CMA gets to and needs to take a stand. Their patients need for us to take this stand. Whether or not anybody else wants to do it is up, uh, you know, the, it's up to the legislature. But with respect to adequate monitoring, um, I think adequate physician supervision could indeed mean telemedicine, but I can tell you, and I don't think it, this, uh, this resolve uh, spells out what adequate is, and that could be defined, and it certainly could be telemedicine. I can tell you in our neighborhood, the, um, uh, these clinics, I've never gotten a call from the clinic on one of my patients, number one, and number two, uh, adequate supervision means a stack of charts in a primary care doctor's office sometimes days after these patients were seen, and that is not adequate supervision. I think the CMA needs to take a very strong stand on this. Thank you. Microphone five. Tom Daly, District 7, uh, speaking as an individual pulmonary critical care physician, uh, speaking in support of this resolution, and especially resolve number four, if retail outlets want to get involved in the business of providing health care, then they have no business selling tobacco. Uh, you cannot push tobacco on patients as you are trying to deliver health care. The two are incompatible, and I would support this resolution and support uh, resolu uh, resolve number four. Okay, microphone one, and a reminder, we're down to one minute and 40 seconds before we close. Uh, Karen Hopp, District 11, uh, no conflict, speaking on behalf mm -hmm. of myself. Well, resolve number four is really attractive. I think it's too big a thing for us to tackle at this point, especially legislatively. I think what we're really trying to do is try to make sure that there's adequate supervision in these retail clinics. You know dang well that this is against CVS, against Rite Aid, against the big players, and I don't think we can win that battle. Thank you. Just a reminder to the House, you are on the end. We've already adopted that amendment. We're discussing the resolution as a whole at this point in time. Microphone two. One minute Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rainey, Specialty Delegation Trustee, and as much as I hate to do this, I move to refer for decision. Yeah, everybody's okay. coming up with different remarks on every clause, and I don't think we can figure it out right now. That, that is in order. Is there a second for referral? Second. Okay. Discussion on referral. Microphone five on referral. Yes. Leffler District, five, District 7. Uh, I was actually planning to make exactly the same motion. This is a complicated issue that involves what kind of health care services are going to be provided, uh, supervision of non-physicians, and issues related to the sale of alcohol and tobacco, and it's such a mess that I'm very uncomfortable voting on it as a whole. Okay, thank you. No further discussion. We do have a motion for referral at this time. All in favor of referral, and I'm sorry, was that referral for decision, Dr. Rainey? Thank you. All in favor of referral for decision, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. And you just went over by 10 seconds on the overall time. All right, item number seven, page six, Dr. Cedars. I'm sorry, it was for, that was referred. You voted for referral. It was a, a, a referral was approved by the House. Your reference committee recommends approval of the following substitute resolution for resolution 60812 and asks for a yes vote on it. Is there debate at microphone six? Uh, yes, Lori Renard, um, speaking for myself and also for. Uh, district approval of District 4 delegation. Um, I'd like to, to go back to the original resolve. I think the reference committee um, has changed it and it's not really in the spirit of the original resolve and I feel that patients could be harmed. You could have mills of clinics set up and the supervising physician um, isn't going to be in the room with the person who's doing the procedure. This is a surgical procedure, and I don't think um, non-physicians should be uh, doing this procedure. Thank you. Do, Dr. Cedars, do you have any comments at this time? There was strong testimony uh, in the committee hearings supporting all of the elements of the dependent clause. Uh, the reference committee felt that in dealing with contentious issues, the CMA is on stronger footing when it bases policy on, on general principles. 
Uh, let me emphasize that the recommended resolution is explicit in stating that procedures are allowed only if one has appropriate training, experience, and supervision. Said otherwise, those elements are necessary but not sufficient to allow one to do the procedure. Thank you. Microphone four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Haskins from the Specialty Delegation, but again, speaking more as the Council on Legislation representation. And I would oppose the return back to the original language for the reasons that were cited exactly by the Reference Committee. Uh, when CMA takes a supportive position instead of an opposed position, then it can stay at the table. When we have an opposed position that gets struck down, we yield into a neutral position and then we're not really having a voice at the table. Uh, the medical procedure cited in this resolution really is very, very specific and CMA is on better footing to expand this to any uh, medical procedure rather than that one specific. And sufficient scientific evidence really is difficult to get in some circumstances where we would want to expand a non-physician practice, the scope of practice, but we don't have specific scientific evidence, rather we have evidence that they have sufficient training and supervision and it would be in the patient's best interest to expand that scope of practice. So uh, the reference committee got it right and we should uh, oppose this amendment. Thank you. Microphone five. Carlson from District 10 speaking for myself. I was attended the reference committee and I strongly oppose this as well for the reasons previously stated. Thank you. Microphone five again, please. Mabali Palala from ACOG and speaking with the support of the specialty delegation. Um, I also speak, uh, I oppose this uh, return back to the language. I think the reference committee has it right. We don't always have a study like this. This is a unique situation. And we have many cases where we have non-physicians performing medical procedures. I think the language that the reference committee came up with is something that can apply to us in future situations and won't hold us. Thank you. Microphone two. Stephanie Dittmer, part of the solo small group practice forum, speaking for myself in opposition to the uh, move to go back to the original resolved. I live in a very rural town in Northern California and within the correct scope of practice and their performance and experience, non-physicians do perform this procedure and have provided a service for the patients in our community. It is hard enough to have physicians performing this particular procedure given the social aspects of it and to limit the uh, scope on this would be a disastrous for patients in my community and around the state. Thank you, microphone one. Yeah, Samopolis, District 11, speaking as an individual, my conflict would be I practice urology and I'm a surgeon. Um, I am speaking in favor of the original resolution. I think it's very important that surgeons retain the ability to do the, the procedures that they were trained to do and that people who may or may not be trained in this procedure as skilled as we are do not perform surgical procedures. Thank you. Microphone one. Meyer, specialty uh, delegation, I, I'm a little confused. Are, are, we, are we discussing the recommendation now of the reference committee? No, let, let me help you understand. There was a move to go to the original language, which is a an amendment by substitution. So you are on the amendment using the original language in lieu of the reference committee. Microphone five. My name is Carol Archie. I'm a member of the specialty delegation and from ACOG. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I feel that it would be very important to stick with the committee's re recommendation. I think that it, in this case, would harm patients by restricting access to a vital medical procedure if we were not to support the safe implementation of, of this um, procedure by people who were really well trained. And that's what that, um, the committee has suggested. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Speaking against the um, original language. Microphone five. 
uh, Ron Hattis, a uh, special delegation as an individual who has actually performed these procedures many, many years ago. Um, I think that the reference committee did get it right. This is a very good general statement that will apply to many other situations. And with respect to aspiration abortions, uh, there are locations in other states, in fact, there are entire states where physicians have been harassed, murdered, terrorized, and it uh, is very difficult to find a physician to be able to uh, perform this. They have to fly them in sometimes from other states, and their lives are sometimes in danger. It would expand availability if we could train physician, uh, uh, you know, nurse practitioners or PAs with proper training and supervision uh, to make this procedure continue to be available. Thank you. I see no one else at the microphones. You have before you the substitution of the original language as an amendment to the Reference Committee's recommendation. All those in favor of the substitution of the original language, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. nay. It is defeated. We are back to the recommendation of the Reference Committee. Is there further discussion? Microphone one. Meyer Specialty Delegation, if we, uh, if we approve this, we have to change the title of the uh, resolution. Um, I, I, it, it's not really germane. The, the title is, we, we can deal with the information and the resolves and appropriately categorize it. Thank you. Microphone six. I think this is a point of information. Yes, Booth, um, District 4. So does that mean that whoever has the license that's overseeing, supervising the individual that's doing the procedure, is their license at risk? They are the physician supervisor. That's generally the case. Okay. We see no other debate. Before you is the recommendation of the reference committee. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. It is adopted. And that, by the way, was another excellent point of information phrase. The next item is item 10 on page 8, Dr. Cedars. Your reference committee recommends approval of the following substitute resolution for resolution 611.12 and asks for a yes vote on it. Thank you. Is there debate? Microphone 3. Beth G. RFS trustee speaking on behalf of the RFS delegation. We would like to make a motion to divide the resolutions. And you are speaking about the resolutions as proposed by the reference committee, correct? Correct. You want them all handled individually? Correct. That is in order. That's, uh, we now have four things to deal with. Is that what you would like? There are yes. Four. Okay. Speak to that. Can you project it first, please? Can you want to you want to project the first resolved only at this time? Yes. Okay. Could you project the amendment as well? Okay. You, you you've asked for division of the question, and now you're asking for amendment of the first resolved. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Let me let me see if I can. Uh, right. The fourth resolved already states res refer for national action. The reason that we would like to add the amendment is because we plan to speak about our reservations on the second and third resolves. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to rule that out of order. If you kill the other ones or alter them to what you want, you then still have the recommendation for national action. That's always handled as a separate resolved. So are okay. we back to the divided question still, or do you want to just address resolves two and three? I'm, I'm confused. Point, microphone two. Mr. Speaker, just to clarify, uh, what the resident fellow section intends to do with this is divide the question. We'd like to vote on this part of the resolution, and the intent is to refer the remainder of the resolution. Uh, if, if we don't have the, the part on uh, referring for national action, and we refer that, then that doesn't get incorporated into this resolve. Is there a better mechanism to accomplish that? L let me suggest that you might want to select resolves two and three, and then debate referral on resolves two and three. 
and leave the others standing. Okay, thank you. Is that your desire? That is the desire of the section, yes. Okay, and, and you, have sec you have support from your delegation. So what you have now is we've extracted resolves two and three. Let's get those projected with a motion for referral for decision or report. Micro microphone two, decision or, re or referral? That's a referral for decision. Okay, you have before you recommendations two and three for referral for decision. Is may I speak to that, Mr. Speaker? Yes, you may. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Eric Eiding, uh, trustee for the resident and fellow section. Um, our concern with, with uh, resolves two and three, and, and the reason why we want to refer this for decision is uh, we do uh, express some uh, reservation to uh, increasing the amount of transparency. Um, it, on both sides of the aisle right now, we're seeing increased scrutiny with graduate medical education, and there is uh, there are some serious threats to, uh, to have this cut. Uh, I think that if we try and highlight uh, this information, and depending on who it is that, that gives us the information uh, about transparency, uh, there is some concern that, that it will be subject to even greater cuts. And for that reason, we would ask that this information or that, that, that these resolves be referred to the board for decision. Thank you. Microphone three on referral of the two resolves. Uh, yes, we, um, my name is Regina Enchizu. I'm from the UCR UCLA Thomas Heider program uh, with no conflict of interest speaking on behalf of the medical student section um, in a unanimous support for referral for decision. Thank you. Is there any further debate? Microphone three. Um, Kaplan, Los Angeles. Um, I was at the uh, uh, the committee meet, the reference committee meeting, and heard this. I would like to support this, and I'd like to add a little bit more information. Um, I knew that Medicare uh, supports uh, the resident, uh, the vast majority of residency education. I did not know that from the East Coast to the West Coast. They support it differently, and even within California, they support it differently. California comes out on the short end at all times, and so I think there's a real need to get the proper information and then be able to take action on it, both locally and at a national level. Again, I speak in support. Thank you. Um, microphone two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ryan Eggers, Loma Linda University. Um, I wasn't voting with the medical student section, and so that's why there appears to be a little bit of conflict. I'm actually in opposition to referral because this issue has come up in the AMA MSS often, and people tend to say, like, oh, we don't want greater transparency because then it might get hacked. But it's not like if we vote this through, all of a sudden they're going to get a report that says, hey, look at these millions of dollars that you can shift somewhere else. The greater transparency is the mechanism by which we can make sure that graduate medical education is distributed fairly. And as was just mentioned, thank you very much by the, uh, the previous speaker, that California gets shortchanged on that. And there's a lot of political motivation for why certain schools get more GME funding than others. And that needs to be let out into the open. And we need to stop that practice. And so we need that greater transparency. And I think we can decide on that. We don't need to refer it to the board for that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone four. Uh, Richard Pan, uh, delegate from the 11th District delegation, uh, speaking as an individual. Um, uh, former member of the AMA Council of Medical Education and, in fact, an author of a policy statement on financing graduate medical education for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, I do speak in favor of uh, the referral because I think there are a lot of issues related to this that aren't captured by the actual language of the resolution that perhaps more may want to look into. Uh, I would say that, first of all, fundamentally, the, this, this maldistribution of uh, residency positions or funding for residency positions under Medicare actually comes from a federal law, Balanced ba Budget Act. In fact, so we can petition CMS, but the, there is actually federal law that sort of mandates the kind of distribution that we have. It's uh, a sort of a relic of, uh, of the debate back then. But 
of course, politically, it's very challenging to shift that law because the East Coast doesn't want to see it changed, even if it doesn't seem to make sense given the demographic changes that there have been, happened in the country. At the same time, when you say greater transparency in terms of uh, in the calculation, uh, actually, there is quite a bit of transparency. Uh, if you want, I can give you the formula for how, that, uh, how, how the funds are distributed. Uh, I think the question then is less about, you know, it is pretty transparent how it's calculated. Uh, I think the issue is, is that is that the appropriate formula, and how's that, uh, and, and then and how's that funding actually linked to actual education? Because the formulas actually are based more on billing than it is on, uh, than on education itself. So that would lead to a fundamental discussion about how we might want to change that. So well, I guess the main part of my remarks would be is that I think we definitely, you know, we can look at the issue. Uh, I would urge communication with the AMA, and then. Um, but I would also urge the authors, and perhaps after if this is passed, to articulate more clearly to the board exactly what they're really wanting to do. Thank you. Thank you. And your speaker apologizes. I tend to want to keep the business moving, and I'm cutting off your emotional applause. I will try to slow down a little bit. Microphone three. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Aaron Wilkes, District 4, speaking as an individual. I am currently also a fellow, um, and I'm actually the AMA RFS uh, speaker at this time. Um, the issue that, the, and I'm speaking, sorry, in support of referral. The reason for that is the medical ramifications of this right now, especially in Washington, um, are extremely delicate. Um, it's already clear based on what's going on with the proposals around Medicare that Washington doesn't understand GME. Um, so bringing this forward at this particular time may not be in our best interest. We definitely support the idea of transparency and eventually the idea of making it more um, uh, appropriately distributed throughout the country, but we just want to be very careful about how this um, proceeds in, in Washington and at the national level, and that's why we're in support of referral. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone one. You, you, you've been up and down. Uh, do you want to go? Okay, pass. Microphone five. Yeah, uh, Jim Bush. Uh, Delegation one, speaking for myself, uh, I want to uh, support the, the motion to uh, refer, and I, I wish the, um, the graduate medical students have a little more success than we have with Gypsy, because I think Gypsy we get the same unfair distribution of funds. Thank you. Thank you. I see no more debate on this item. Microphone two. Microphone two. I'm sorry. No. My, just a point of information, and my question was, was there anyone else at the mic behind me? And it sounds like there isn't, and so I don't need to close debate. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So we are on one item only, and that is referral of resolves two and three. All those in favor of referring resolves two and three for decision, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Those two are referred. You have before you resolves one and four. Is there further debate? Seeing none, actually, a microphone three. RFS supports uh, resolutions one and four. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of resolves one and four as written in front of you, please say aye. aye. All opposed, say nay. They are adopted. There being no further business before the House, closing comment, well, before the House for this committee, anyway. Okay. Closing comments, please. Dr. Cedars. Mr. Speaker, this concludes the report of Reference Committee F. I would like to thank the CMA members who testified. Our committee members, Christopher R. Hancock, M.D., Craig H. Kleiger, M.D., Maria T. Limbaris, M.D., James B. Rubin, M.D., Robert Dudley Stone, M.D., and Ronald W. B. Wyatt, Jr., M.D., and our wonderful CMA staff, Yvonne Chung and Patricia Moyle. Thank you. And, and we thank you for a report with only three extractions, quite a rarity. It's a point of information, microphone five. Smith, Smith from Medium Group. Is this a record uh, for a reference, completion of reference committee? The less you talk, the more of a record it's going to be. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are going to recess early. We do have two more reference committee reports to do in the morning, plus the one item of business plus uh, Reference Committee C, which has to be reheard because of the rules. <clears throat> so we do have business to conduct. 
but I think we'll get through it in the time allotted, so we're going to let you go early. Um, I hope most, if not all of you, are going to the President's reception in Gala. It's supposed to start very shortly at the California Museum. There are buses from the Hyatt and from the Sheraton, and um, they'll take you there, they'll bring you back. It's gonna be a good time. Please have a good time and enjoy the evening. We'll see you bright and early.